Okay, today we're going to learn to use the separating funnel. The separating funnel is another essential piece of chemistry glassware. You'll see them in every chemistry lab in the world. First things first, you have to clamp it correctly. So you clamp it around the neck and make sure that the upper lip on the top of the neck sits above the clamp. Don't clamp it any other way as you're just asking for it to break. And that's where the stopper goes in too. At the bottom is the stopcock and that controls the flow of liquid out of the funnel. You'll see if you look carefully, there's a small hole going through it. And so if we turn it by 90 degrees, the liquid can now flow out. And if we turn it back, you'll once again see the hole is no longer lined up to allow liquid to flow out and the flow stops. Start, stop. And so that gives us the control to allow the liquid to flow out of the funnel. Okay, now I'm going to demonstrate using one. So two things to start off. Check that the stopcock is working and put a conical flask in place underneath the flask. Lower it down a little bit to make sure that it's not going to splash as the liquid comes down. Next, what I'm going to use is I'm going to use chloroform, which is contaminated with iodine. So I'm going to try and extract the iodine out of the chloroform. And so now I'm going to pour it into the separating funnel. Before pouring anything into the separating funnel, you should stop and check. And the reason that you always put the conical flask there first is in case you don't make this check and you make the mistake. You have to make sure though that the funnel is closed before you start pouring anything into it. And you do that by showing that the arm of the stopcock is at 90 degrees to the spout. You can also see the hole going through if you look carefully when you have it in front of you. So now I can put in my chloroform. I put in my chloroform and then I'm going to put in the water. And of course water floats on chloroform because chloroform is heavier than water. Next I put my lid in and I take my separating funnel out of the clamp. And now what I'm going to do is shake it. Before I shake it I have to make sure of two things. One, that the stopper is securely in place and two, that I'm holding it so that it's not going to fall out. Give it a small shake and then vent the pressure out so it will immediately have some pressure form inside. Vent it, give it a much stronger shake and then vent it again. And when you're venting it, make sure that it is not pointing at anyone or anything within the lab because some liquid is going to come out of it. Not very much, but you certainly want it not to go towards somebody's face or eyes or onto anything that might be of value or might be taken out of the lab. So just be a little bit careful when you're doing that. Once you've given it a good shake, check the stopper comes out and there's not too much pressure in it, and then you can clamp it again and wait for it to separate out. After a little while, you'll see that all of the iodine has remained in the chloroform layer, and that's because iodine is not soluble in water. It's a non-polar molecule, and so it has no reason to dissolve. So what do we do? Well, we let the bottom layer out through the tap. Give it a few minutes, I've sped it up a little bit. And just before the end, you can take it out of the clamp and swirl it around in case there are any little blobs of solvent stuck up in the water layer, as can often happen. Clamp it again and finish draining it. Once you've finished draining it then, we want to take the water layer out. It didn't do a good job of extracting it, we want it out of the separating funnel. The top layer always comes out the top of the separating funnel. So the bottom layer goes out the bottom and the top layer goes out the top. And that way we avoid contaminating the two layers with the small amount of bottom layer that is going to be remaining inside the channel inside the stopcock. So just unclamp it and pour it into another conical flask. Simple as that. Once we've emptied our separating funnel, we can put the chloroform back in again because we want to have another go at extracting it. This time we're going to use something a little bit different. We're going to use a solution of potassium iodide. So potassium iodide, as you'll know from your lectures, contains I minus. And the I minus, or the iodide, is going to react with the iodine to form I3 minus, which is polar and of course soluble then in water. So if we give this a go and we extract it, we should be able to take the pink or purple color out of the chloroform. Watch as I pour this, I'm going to pause it for a second and see that the liquid is clear before it hits the water. And as soon as it hits the water then, it starts to extract out the iodine. But of course, we can very much speed it on its way by giving it a good shake. And you notice that I vent it, shake it, vent it, and that the chloroform is now significantly less iodine in it. And you can tell that based on the color of it. Of course, we want all of the iodine out of the chloroform. So take the water layer, top layer out the top, store it in a conical flask, and then just simply extract again. Again, I've sped all this process up. It'll take quite a few minutes to do this in the lab, and with a bit of practice it'll get a little bit faster, but it's always a reasonably slow process. 
Simply because it takes time for the material to transfer from one layer to another layer and you have to give it that time or your separation is not going to work very well. So again, shake, vent, shake, vent, shake, vent, clamp it. Allow the two layers to separate, drain the bottom layer out the bottom and you can see our chloroform is almost colourless now so it's done a really good job. And then top layer out the top. And just to show how successful our extraction was, you can compare the purple of the old chloroform with the now extracted chloroform. Okay, on to a different example. In my hand I have a solution in methyl terbutyl ether, which of course is lighter than water, so this time it's going to sit on top. And let's have a look at one or two other aspects of doing a successful separation. Well, we put our two layers in, and same as last time, we're going to put a stopper in, and we're going to shake them. So, again, sped up, vent, shake, vent, shake, and clamp it again. This time the two layers are much, much slower to separate. And again, I will speed it up just for the sake of time, but you can see that they form nearly an emulsion. Sometimes this is a real problem in organic chemistry, and you have to do things like add salt or add a little bit of acetone. In our case, though, we're just going to wait for it to happen, and we can speed it up. Once it has separated, though, there's an issue that we're never actually going to get all of the water out of the organic layer. So we have to do something to help ourselves with that. And what we can do is, once we've decided we're not going to wait anymore, we do our separation, and we put our organic layer, top layer, out the top, bottom layer, out the bottom. But we take this layer, and we're going to use something to dry it. And so we can use a drying agent like calcium chloride or magnesium sulfate. And what's that, what that's going to do is like those little silica beads that you see inside new electronics you buy, it's just going to mop up the water. So our organic layer is the purple layer. Let's get rid of the water layer for now. And what we're going to use is calcium chloride. So this is calcium chloride and this is dry. So when you're using it, it's important to put the lid back on. Otherwise it'll turn into a watery sticky mess because it'll pull the water out of the air as, e as easily as it'll pull the water out of your organic solvent. So with the spatula, very carefully, take your anhydrous calcium chloride, so without water, calcium chloride, and just add a few lumps into the bottom. It doesn't have to be an exact amount, but you'll start to get the idea of how much is needed, because if there's not enough, it'll look all watery on the bottom, and if there's too much, well, you're just wasting the material, and it'll probably hold on to some of your product that you're hoping to get back out of your organic layer. Once you've put it in and given it a little bit of a swirl, wait a few minutes. Again, it's about patience. Two or three minutes and it'll work just fine. And once you've waited, then what you want to do is you want to leave that solid behind. So another quick shake and what we're going to do is just leave that solid behind. And the solid now has all the water that was in the organic solvent. We're going to leave that solid behind by decanting. And decanting is just a fancy way of saying pouring off and leaving the solids at the bottom. So that's exactly what we're going to do now. We take our beaker with the solvent and the solids at the bottom and just carefully pour it out leaving the solids behind. And that way we now have our organic solvent with no water and we can evaporate off our organic solvent to give us back whatever we had dissolved in it without any problems with additional water. Okay one last thing I want to show you then. So what I've done here is I've taken some markers. Some are permanent and some are non-permanent. And in the left I've added in water and in the right, I've added in dichloromethane, which is a relatively non-polar solvent when you compare it to water. Half of them are permanent and half of them are non-permanent. So you might have an idea as to which ones are dissolving in which. The non-permanent ones are quite polar and dissolve easily in the water. The permanent ones dissolve easily in the dichloromethane because they're designed to resist dissolving in water and be permanent and not easily washed away. And so you can see, if we take the paper out, Half the spots are untouched by one solvent, and the other half of the spots are untouched by the other solvent. And the two solvents have taken on a very different colour, because I chose different colours of marker with different inks, so that we could see the different layers. If we put them into a separating funnel, we can see that dichloromethane is going to be the heavier solvent. It's going to end up down at the bottom. But also we can see that the two colours don't transfer between the layers, because the non-polar substances are happy in the non-polar layer, and the polar substances are happy in the water. So no matter how much we spend our time shaking this, it's just going to stay like that. And you can watch that happen now. That's all for this week though. So if you have any questions, post them up on Moodle in the form, post them below in the comments section. You can always like the video if you want. Otherwise, see you in the lab. If you have any questions then, feel free to ask. That's all for now. Bye!